All right, we're continuing our documentation series. This is the third video in the documentation series. And if you remember, we are talking about PPP forgiveness applications and what documents are required. And this one is specifically to report the 3508 application, okay? So if you did not qualify for the S because your loan was more than 50,000 and you did not qualify for the EZ because you weren't able to certify to those um, kind of simplified rules on um, not reducing salaries and wages and not reducing headcount, then you need to use the 3508 form. Now, doesn't mean that this is all that much scarier from a documentation standpoint or anything like that. Really the calculations are what can get a little bit challenging on the 3508, but when we talk about the documentation, it is pretty much goes along lines with what we needed to do for the 3508S and the 3508EZ. So we're going to go over that and some of this will sound familiar if you watch the other two videos and then we will talk about what in addition to what we needed to do for the other two forms we need to do for the 3508 full form. All right, so if that sounds interesting to you, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I love to make sure that I get this information to you in a timely manner. So make sure you also put the little notification, click that little bell, the notification button, because that means that as soon as I put out a video to you, you will get a notification that there's something new. Sometimes I really do try to get out timely stuff that I might have just heard about, and then I'm trying to get it out to you as quickly as possible, especially if I feel like, hey, this is something that borrowers need to know ASAP. I will try to get a video out as fast as I possibly can. So the notifications are awesome for that. Um, so make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell. And then if this video is helpful, please also give it a thumbs up because it helps me out and put any comments that you might have in the comment section below. Okay, so 3508, same like the other two forms. We need to make sure we've done our best to fill out the application before we even go to our bank to apply. So try to fill it out as best as you can, and that includes the Schedule A. So you will need to provide the Schedule A, or at least the information that goes into the Schedule A will need to be provided to the bank. Um, now, there, there is, when you look at the application, there's also the Schedule A worksheet, and you don't have to turn that in anywhere. So I wanna let you guys know that, but you kinda of have to do the worksheet in order to then get the answers that go into the Schedule A. So it's kind of a weird process, but for whatever reason they did it that way and I'm just telling you guys what they're asking for. <laughs> so you have to do the worksheet, but you don't have to turn it in, essentially. So keep it in your audit file. Um, okay, so we're gonna get into what we need to do for payroll costs. Now, payroll costs can either be the easiest thing <laughs> or the most complicated. If you have a payroll provider, this should be fairly easy for you to prove out these costs. So we're gonna go over exactly what you need to do. So the first thing that you need to provide proof for is your cash compensation to your employees. So this could look like, and what it probably will look like is third-party payroll reports. Third-party payroll reports are the best evidence that you can give to the bank to prove out your payroll costs, okay? And go back and look at, um, I did a video that said how to read payroll reports to apply for forgiveness. I went through Paychecks, Gusto, and QuickBooks payroll. But essentially, if you have ADP or you have another form, it's going to be, if, if you get the gist of what we're looking for there, that will be helpful no matter what payroll system you use, okay? So you're gonna to need to provide the payroll reports for the cash compensation during the time and, and what you're trying to prove out the expense for. The second thing that you're going to need is tax forms. Um, and the, they say or equivalent third-party payroll reports um, that show the taxes paid to both the federal government and your state and local authorities. So let's say you pay quarterly unemployment taxes, you're going to wanna to include that report for the overlapping time period of when your covered period is. So if your covered period started in May, but your quarter ended in June, you want to include the June report. And then it might also include September, right? Because 
if you, especially if you have the 24 week cover period, you're going to include September and you're actually probably, you might be required to go ahead and include the December 31st reports as well. I haven't seen any bank ask for those yet, but it is a possibility we might want to consider. Okay. Now that is to prove out your tax, your taxes, and then your cash compensation. The third thing is that you will need either payment receipts or canceled checks or account statements showing that you've paid to prove out healthcare contributions on the employer side, as well as retirement contributions on the employer side. Okay, so if you're trying to get those costs covered with the PPP loan, you're going to have to prove that you made the payment and that the agency or the, um, the business receiving those premiums or those contributions that they received it. So let's say you're using Primera and, and you're paying your healthcare into Primera. Primera probably has a statement on that side that shows that a payment was received and what the new balance is. And then the next month it'll show the payment that was received and the new balance. So that proves to the banks that you actually did spend the money on healthcare, right? Um, they also are going to, if you don't for some reason have account statements, you can put your payment receipts. Like if you paid online and you got a receipt coming back for it, you can do that. Additionally, a canceled check. So if you physically write a check, you can go into your online banking and print out like what, what the canceled check looks like after it passes through the bank. Okay. Now, the big thing about that is that we can't just rely on the employer reports from the payroll provider. Because a lot of times on your payroll reports, it'll say exactly what your healthcare contributions are in, during the period, but they're saying that's not enough. They're saying that they also wanna see those payments actually going out to whoever it is that's, that has the retirement account or the, um, the health insurance company, okay? Now, one thing that you're going to need to provide if um, on top of everything else that we've already covered for payroll costs is that you're going to need to provide supporting documentation about your FTE count during your look back period. So if you didn't qualify for any of the safe harbors and you are choosing, let's say, January 1 to February 29th of this year as your look back period for your FTE comparison, then you're going to need to provide the payroll reports or whatever it is, proving out your FTE for that, for that time period. Okay. So that's kind of in addition to everything else that that's um, been asked for regarding payroll costs. So that is the payroll cost that, or that all of those documents would help you prove out payroll costs. Now, if you do not have a third party payroll provider and you've been doing this um, somehow you're getting around it and you're not doing that piece, I would say you are going to have to provide bank account statements showing any payroll costs that you're trying to get forgiveness for. The other thing that I would say, which is not specifically in the instructions, is that if you are trying to claim, claim owner's compensation for yourself under the PPP, um, then you're going to have to prove it, you're going to have to prove your owner's compensation amounts. So if you're a sole proprietor, you're going to need to provide your 2019 Schedule C. If you are a partnership, you're going to need to provide 2019 K-1s. And then if you are S Corp or C Corp and you pay yourself with W-2 wages, you're going to need to provide your 2019 W-2. All right. Now, I don't know why they're not asking for that when we actually look at the uh, forgiveness instructions. However, banks are asking for this. So I'm telling you guys because I'm seeing that as something that we're going to have to provide one way or the other. All right. So if once we get into non-payroll costs, I want to go over this with you guys. Now, remember with non-payroll costs, and if you've been watching my videos for a while, you probably will remember this, but anything we try to claim for non-payroll costs has to be an expense that the business was incurring before, well, basically pre-COVID. So before February 15th, 2020, that thing that we're going to try to get forgiveness for had to already be in place. So a rent or a lease would already have to be in place or maybe a utility that you already use. These things would have to have already been existing in the business as an expense before February 15th if we're going to include them as allowable costs 
in, for the purposes of PVP, all right? So let's go over real quick what type of documentation you need to you need to provide. So if you are trying to claim for business mortgage interest, there's a couple things you need to. So if you're paying a payment for a mortgage, most likely you've got principal and interest both combined in your payment, unless you're doing an interest only type loan. Now, when this happens, um, we're not going to be able to put to just show our check to the mortgage company and have that be enough. You're going to have to provide something that also shows the breakout between interest and principal. So they're saying that you can either provide the amortization schedule, which is that detailed amortization that shows um, the principal amount, the amount of interest charge per period. And it's usually like a very long Excel spreadsheet um, or maybe PDF or something. Um, but it will show the breakout between principal and interest and then the payment amount. You can provide that and receipts or canceled checks for the payment that was made or you can show lender account statements from February, 2020 through, um, through the end of the cover period or February, 2020, and then during the covered period. I don't think they're really gonna care about March and April if you got your loan in May, but have them ready. I told you guys this from the very beginning is have this information ready because they are going to care about it. And look, here we are <laughs> having to provide it. So hopefully you were saving those along the way. Um, but those lender account statements would show principal and interest to so make sure it shows it on there. And then it'll also show when a payment has been made and then what the next one is due. So in that situation, they're not really asking for canceled checks or receipts. Okay. Because the statement is showing that it was received on the other side. Um, now, if you are trying to get your rent or your lease payments covered by the PPP, you're going to have to provide a couple of things. So first, you have the option of providing the lease or the rental agreement, and then again, receipts or canceled checks showing that the payment went through. Because you could have a lease, but that doesn't mean you're making payments. So they have to have that, that kind of, hey, we need to know that the payments were actually made in order to then um, count that as an expense, right? Um, and they're gonna see that the lease they're going to see when that was put in place. So if it was put into place like days after you got your PPP loan, sorry, that's not going to work. <laughs> We're not going to be able to do that. But if it was put into place three years ago and you know, it's, it's a non-issue. Okay. So it just has to be in place before February 15th. Now, um, the third thing or the other option you have, if you don't have a lease and those cancel checks, you can also get uh, the lessor account statements. So if you're whoever you're renting from, if they give you account statements and they're showing that rent was paid and more was due and rent was paid and more was due, um, then it shows again that kind of in and out from that third party because then that shows that the, it's actually been paid, okay? That your rent has actually been paid. And those, again, similar to like with the mortgage, mortgage interest, you need to have it from February, 2020, showing that it was in place and then during the cover period. Now, the third thing that is a non-payroll cost that we can apply for forgiveness for are business utility payments. And these are pretty simple. What you're going to need is you're going to need a copy of the invoice for the bill of whatever the utility was, and then you're gonna need payment. So you're gonna need um, receipts or cancel checks or account statements showing that it has been paid over time, okay? So you remember, it kind of goes back to that principle of, did you owe it and did you pay it? You need to have two pieces of information there to make sure that the expense is valid. Did you owe it, did you pay it, okay? So owing it is things like the, the rental agreement, it's things like the bills, the utilities, or the account statements, and then did you pay it? Cancel checks, receipts, and um, account statements showing that your amount has been credited on the statements, okay? Now, one thing to remember here is that you need to remember that the amount you're applying for forgiveness for needs to match to some sort of documentation. So if, you, if your rent is $200 a month and you're trying to apply for six months of rent, then you need to have $1,200, because remember six times 200 is 1,200, $1,200 worth of proof showing that you had those legitimate expenses, okay? Um, so you need to have 
six $200 checks, canceled checks, or you need to have your statements for those six months showing that those payments were received each month. Okay. So the big deal is that we need to match the amount that we're asking for to the actual documentation. So, you know, there's no gaps of information because if the bank looked and all you had was, you know, the, the lease, they're going to go, well, you know, this is incomplete documentation and they're going to come back and ask you for more information. All right. So that's all of the stuff that the bank can ask for. And remember, you only need to submit documentation up to the amount of your PPP loan. So if you, let's say your PPP loan was $40,000. However, you had $80,000 of eligible expenses. When you roll in all these things, you don't have to include all of that. So, um, that's your choice. You can choose like if it's easy for you to just document payroll by itself and that covers all $40,000 of your expense or your PPP loan, then just go with that. Additionally, <laughs> on top of everything else we've already covered, the audit files for a 3508 form are going to be pretty hefty. <laughs> if you've had any movement with your FTEs, which at this point, if you are filling out the 3508, it probably means you have had fairly significant shifts in your FTEs. So if you've had anybody leave, anybody come back, anybody you've rehired new employees, you've uh, tried to hire for jobs and you weren't able to, people left voluntarily, all this stuff, we're going to make sure all of that is documented. Um, the other thing is that if you have anything, like a lot of those would be considered FTE exemptions. Any FTE exemption that you're putting on your Schedule A worksheet, you're going to make sure you need to have some piece of supporting documentation saying why you believe that they should be exempt. Okay, so if they, let's say they went on maternity leave and that would be a valid FTE reduction because somebody was, you know, maybe still employed, but they chose to go on maternity leave. Um, you know, documenting their maternity leave would be a proof of the FTE exemption, let's say, for example. Um, now, you're also going to need to document any salaries and wage reductions from the worksheet A. So pretty much that worksheet A we talked about earlier, like at the very beginning of the video, you're going to need to provide that as evidence. And then essentially think through anything that's an anomaly that doesn't prove back directly to a payroll report, you need to have something supporting that document. So um, let's say let's say your average hours could be tied to a payroll report or like something coming from maybe your payroll provider. I've seen a really great um, report from ADP that has a nice comparison. Um, you can put that in your payroll file, in your audit file. Um, let's say that you, let's say that you notified employees that you were going to reduce their wages, um, but it was going to be by, you know, 20%, not 25. I would go ahead and like keep a note of that in your file. Really anything that supports any changes in salaries and wages during the time or any changes in the actual employment or, you know, substantial changes in the hours that the employees are working, we need to save documentation around that, okay? Um, job offers refusals, uh, refusal, um, refusing to accept restorations, um, notices that you sent to, let's say, the unemployment office. If you tried to give somebody a job and they refused, then you can, you're supposed to report those people, you know? So if you've made that type of, um, if you've made that type of report to your unemployment agency, you can keep a copy of that in your file as well. Now, remember that you also need to keep um, any documentation supporting the certifications that you made to the application as well. So um, if you're unable to operate between February 15th and the end of the cover period because of some sort of health ordinance, documentation supporting that would need to be included in your audit file. And also, let's say you don't have to go and prove out all of your FTEs and use a look back period like we talked about earlier. If you don't need to do all of that and you think you qualify for one of the safe harbor checkboxes, you want to provide supporting documentation of why you believe you qualify for either one of those as well. All right, so 3508 is a little heftier, but um, I hope that's helpful. I'll try to break it down for you a little bit and um, try to figure out like how it's really different from the other ones. Really just keep in mind that all of this documentation is kind of 
Um, it's a little security blanket for you. So if for some reason you get audited a couple years down the road and you need to find something, just think about that security blanket. What do you want to have in it? You want it to be as robust as possible. Okay. And remember all this documentation needs to be kept for six years. Okay. Six years. So all the more reason to have a digital copy somewhere, maybe a digital copy and then a backup copy, <laughs> this stuff you do not want to lose. All right. So I hope that's helpful. Please give this video a thumbs up if you got all the way to the end. And thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And I hope this is helpful on your PPP journey.